This is Bob Mayer, and this is the story behind my story. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit hankgarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Bob Mayer. Essence, Book 1, Septima, the first volume in the exciting new science fiction series by Nick Breaker. Troy is no longer himself. Kidnapped by aliens infected with the essence of the dead General Tomas, Troy grasps at his only hope of survival. He merges his soul with the alien parasite trying to possess him, leaving him forever changed, and not entirely for the worse. Once plagued by crippling phobias, Troy is now fearless willing to fight his enemies with his bare hands. But with his new strength also comes a new weakness, women. Tomas was notorious for his insatiable desires, and Troy finds himself constantly resisting temptation, especially the gorgeous, manipulative Alta. Although Alta has convinced the Purans she's helping them prepare to battle the murderous Reptarans, she's actually meticulously planning to steal their ultimate power source and then abandon them to their fate. Alta won't hesitate to kill anyone in her way, and her deep love for Tomas is Troy's only advantage. He convinces Alta that Tomas has taken full control of his being and thus keeps her trust and his life. While Alta schemes, Troy covertly struggles to save the Purans and prevent the Reptorans from invading Earth, but first he must wrest back control of his own soul. Essence, Book 1, Septima, the first volume in the exciting new science fiction series, by Nick Breaker. Find it on Amazon today. There's a link in the show notes. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Bob Mayer on the show with me today. Bob is the author of the Area 51 series, uh, as well as several other series. Uh, a busy, busy man. Uh, thank you uh, for coming on the show, Bob. Oh, thanks for having me, Hank. I begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or a storyteller? Um, I don't think – I'm not one of those people who always wanted to be a writer. I was always a reader. As a kid growing up in the Bronx, I spent pretty much all my free time in the local library. felt like I read my way through that place and then uh, moved on to the next library in New York City. And also every Sunday, my uncle would take me down to, there used to be an indie bookstore on 18th Street in Manhattan called Barnes & Noble uh, before it went chain. And that was a really neat experience to go all the way down there because Manhattan was a world away like Saturday Night Fever. And uh, we'd go visit that and it would just be tables stacked with books. And that was really neat. That's awesome. So you were a, a voracious reader. What kinds of stuff did you read? I read everything. I mean, I used to be able to... Uh, do the Dewey Decimal System real well. I can tell you exactly what, you know, 700s, 750s, uh, everything, thrillers, a lot of history. I feel like most of what I know came from books. Yeah, I, I, I'm i with you there. I, I tell people all the time that I was I was a horrible student in school, uh, but everything that I learned, I learned from books and from, you know, digging into something that I wanted to know about. And uh, the, that's the beauty of reading is uh, it's a it's a lifelong education. It never stops. So, um, thrillers, uh, history did, uh, you know, your books really kind of touch all over the place. And I, I see those influences. Um, did, were you a big science fiction fan? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the golden age of science fiction. My, actually one thing my wife and I talk about is there's a three book series. Um, I don't remember what the name of it is. We both had it. It's one of the reasons we got together. We all had the same books, but, uh, it was the classic short stories of science fiction and, uh, we were just talking about that the other day, some of the stories we were remembering from that. Um, just the imagination. It's phenomenal. Yeah. Those uh, those Golden Age science fiction books, uh, I think, um, uh, so have motivated so many people. Uh, 
and I, I often lament that uh, it seems like the tone of science fiction has changed in the last, uh, in, in the last few years and everything seems to be so dark and, uh, kind of post apocalyptic has taken over everything. But, uh, I love those stories that, that kind of gave us hope and challenged us to, to look to maybe, um, uh, you know, uh, science could push us to something better. I think that's that's changing a bit, though. What I where I see it changing is things like uh, Blue Horizon and the the companies that are actually going back out into space. Because if you told us back in '69 we wouldn't be to the moon again, nobody would have believed you. Exactly. But that is changing. So I think hopefully people will be more positive. Yeah, it, it's the craziest thing that you know Elon Musk launches a car into space a few weeks ago, and everybody just went nuts. And um, I, I love seeing that. That was like the uh, it's like we were about something again. Uh, so I love that. That's awesome. Um, so at what point did you decide to that you wanted to be a writer? Actually, I had uh, resigned my active duty commission in the military, moved to the Orient to study martial arts. And you can only work out so many hours a day. And I had the original 512K Mac um, that came out in 84. Mm. So I had time on my hand. I said, yeah, you know, I'm why not? And I just started writing and I wrote my first manuscript and I wrote my second manuscript and it never occurred to me to sell it till someone read it and said, Hey, this is like a real book. And then I did everything wrong business wise trying to sell it. But eventually I did get an agent and that's how I got started. Yeah. What were those uh, original stories that you wrote? What, what genre and, and kind of where did the idea for those come from? They were military thrillers and they were based on my experiences. They were the green beret series is what I started with. Uh, I'd, Made it easy on myself because you know I could focus on the writing because the stories were based on real missions I had done in, in special forces. Nice. Uh, so, how long were you in the military? Uh, I was active duty about ten years, and then a bunch of years in reserve. Okay, and uh, and that began your Green Beret series. Uh, when when someone read those and, and you kind of decided, okay, these are these are real books. Uh, what did you? How did you go about getting those published? Uh, back in the old days, <laughs> in traditional <laughs> publishing, snail mail, there was no email. Uh, I just sent out queries to everybody, and I got tons and tons of rejections. And then I did what they say don't do, so I don't believe in following rules. I just queried everybody. And one day, I back dates, and I got a phone call. And a guy said, you know, we're this small press in Nashville. He says, we don't do fiction, so you sent it to the wrong person. He says, but we know an agent. And he forwarded what I sent to the agent, and that's how I got my first agent. <laughs> so that's kind of why I'm... When I hear people saying, be very careful about what you do, I said, just do it. Oh, you never yeah. know what's going to happen. Uh, yeah, and, and you cannot discount dumb luck. You know, yeah. you just don't know when something's going to fall to the right person that, that'll do you a solid and say, <laughs> yeah. we don't do it, but we know someone who does. That, that's yeah, awesome. Publishing is a very friendly business overall, I find. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's usually when you decide to take it too seriously that, uh, that you've taken it too seriously. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so what year was this that you began uh, writing and publishing? Oh, I started writing in 1988. My first book came out in 1991. Okay, so that would have been uh, military thrillers were really uh, making a big splash then. It was kind of the heyday of Clancy and uh, a lot of those guys. So, uh, was the market uh, really responsive to to what you were putting out? They were, but I didn't understand the business at all, and I was already shifting over to more science fiction type books. Um, I just wasn't that uh, excited writing military thrillers like that. So I just, I've always written, wrote whatever I felt like writing, which is not a great co career plan, but it's a lot of fun. Well, that that brings up a great question because uh, you know so many people talk about writing to market, and uh, and, and you know there's a lot of truth to that, and there's a lot of uh, business savvy in, uh, in taking that advice. Uh, but you know, the, I, I'm of the opinion that I just don't know how long you can sustain that. Um, I, I guess if you're making a career of it and you think of it as a job, um, you know, you can punch the clock and, and go to work writing books that you don't love all day long, but, uh, that doesn't make for a very happy writer, does it? No, I've met a bunch of best selling writers who are kind of stuck. Uh, I mean, I remember Sue Grafton talking to her, you know, I think she did get a little bit tired of the Alphabet series. Um, you know, she changed her character, Kinsey Mahone, in any way. The readers went bonkers. And I know for me, after a certain number of books with the same character, you're just kind of like, okay, I pretty much have done everything I can possibly do with this. It's time to move on. 
but I, I just like to me the fun part is researching and learning new things. Um, I've written in so many genres now. I'm actually the only male author on the Romance Writers of America honor roll. Um, I'm a member of SFWA, Romance Writers of America, a bunch of other organizations. Um, it's just to me the big thing is just write what you want to write, have passion come through. Yeah. Um, when you do decide to switch genres, uh, are there any tricks that you use to um, to kind of get into the mind space of, of maybe writing romance or science fiction or military thrillers, or does the story just come first and it all just comes from Bob? Uh, the story comes first. What I find is um, I focus a lot now when I teach writing and my wife and I run workshops in our house is that uh, it's called process. I know a lot of writers and we talk about it. How do you create and we're all kind of similar, but we're all kind of different. Um, I do a lot more stream of consciousness now than I used to. I used to be a big outliner. And now I trust my um, subconscious more. I assume it's working in my interests, and I just do a lot. I write. I sit down, and as uh, Bryce Corton used to say, I've got bum glue. Got to sit in a chair and knock the words out. <laughs> I like that, bum glue. Um oh. So you were writing the military thrillers, but uh, you had switched over to science fiction. Uh, what uh, what types of science fiction were you writing there to begin with? Well, I started switching on my um, let's see, my third book in the Green Beret series was called Sinbat, which t- terrible title stands for Synthetic Battle Form, and I was doing you know what's the next evolution of soldier, and that started me there. And, and actually, I wrote a book called The Rock, which was supposed to be a standalone based on a. Uh, an idea my wife and I had talked out, and that did relatively well. And the next book actually was Area 51, and Area 51 was supposed to be a standalone, but of course uh, it took off. 1995, Independence Day came out, the title, uh, and I ended up with nine books in that series. And 20 years later, I'm revisiting it, and it's kind of cool because I think I'm ready now. Back then, I was like, oh, this is done. It's over with. And now it was really fun because this book just pulled all these elements I wrote 20 years ago together. And I'm pretty excited about it. That's, I, I guess I have uh, read. I've discovered the series in in your revisiting it. Uh, I guess, and I I absolutely love it. It's uh, because not only is it science fiction, the Area 51 series. Not only is it science fiction. Um, you know, you've got these uh, kind of historical conspiracies, and uh, you know, uh, a lot of weird history. Uh, where did the idea for that uh, original book that became a series, where did that original idea come from? That was before Area 51 was big or in the press because uh, Independence Day and X-Files was after I wrote Area 51. And actually I titled it Dreamland because that's the call sign at Nellis Air Force Base. And my editor called up and said, ah, that sounds like a fantasy book. And I'm really glad I changed the title. But I was talking to a pilot and they said that flying out from Fort Campbell to the National Training Center at Fort Irwin, California, they had to divert around Area 51, their space there was as uh, secure as lighthouses. I thought, well, that's interesting. So then I just got interested and started researching um, Area 51, and I pretty much found out that all the conspiracy theories came from one guy, and everybody was repeating it, and it sounded like 500 people were saying the same thing, but it was really one source. Interesting. Um, so, but you also, you know, you've got a, a story thread in there that's in, uh, Egypt and, uh, you know, so you've got this ancient Egypt, uh, connection, uh, where did, uh, you said that you were a, a, a history buff, you know, going way back. Um, when you start pulling the threads of this to, to make it, uh, was this something you'd been thinking about for a while and, you know, well, I've got this, this kind of weird historical fact over here and this would kind of dovetail, um, or do those things just kind of start coalescing in your mind in the writing? It's like connecting the dots when you start doing research. You know, back before the internet, I'd, <laughs> the library would get mad at me because I'd be checking out books and I'm going to recheck them out and recheck them out. I have stacks and stacks of books in my office. And what I found, I like to joke, Area 51, I rewrote the entire history of mankind, you know, going over 10,000 years ago. And I drew in everything the Great Wall of China, Atlantis, uh, the Pyramid, the Sphinx, Jack the Ripper. Uh, in Redemption, you know, Tesla's granddaughter, which technically he doesn't have a granddaughter, but that's a plot point. Um, she makes an appearance and Tesla plays a big role in the story. Um, you know, the history of vampires and Nosferatu. I did that. Well, uh, Nosferatu is back in this book. It was kind of neat to bring in all the elements of nine books, which I didn't think I could do, but it, it worked actually pretty well. 
Um, and I'm really excited about the new direction the, the series has taken off. And I already got the next, I'm already, I work on the next two books. Wow. Uh, so you've been working on the series for, for over 20 years now. Right. But in timeline, the book coming out in April starts the day after the last book. Okay. Gotcha. So how long of a break was there uh, in the, uh, the writing the original series before picking it up and, and deciding to continue it? I think the last book came out in uh, 2001, so this is 2018, 17 years since okay. the last book. Gotcha. Um, I had to go back and read it myself. <laughs> so a lot has changed in publishing in that time. Uh, was the, the original series, was it traditionally published? It was published by Random House and sold over a million copies, um, mass market paperback. And then one day you get that letter in the mail saying, you know, thank you very much. We're not interested in anything anymore because they, they put pretty much zero marketing behind it, uh, which I kind of understand authors bitch about that a lot. I actually called them up one day and said, OK, stop lying to me and tell me you're going to market the books when you're not going to just tell me. And I said, who do you put your marketing money behind? And they said, our best sellers. And at the moment, I was like, well, how do I become one? They're like, we don't know. But what do you help you? <laughs> Well, it's a it's a crazy thing. I talk to a lot of authors, and whether you're traditionally published or self published or a hybrid author, uh, you really are in charge of your marketing. Uh, okay. You know that the the publishers do put a certain amount of uh, you know uh, juice behind authors, but it's it's pretty short lived. So if if you're gonna market a book, it it's your job to do it, isn't it? Yeah, and back in the in traditional publishing, it's still true. The really only good marketing money they could give you is uh, placement, co-op money, placement in the bookstore, placement in the supermarket. That's it. Everything else is frills. Uh, nowadays, it's discoverability. And where can you put your money? Well, you can run um, placement on Amazon. It's about it. So really, it doesn't matter. Um, the, market, the business has completely changed, I think, and traditional publishing has sort of caught up with it, but they haven't. Uh, especially for mid-list authors. I think a mid-list author who has not at least gone hybrid is in big trouble right now because Barnes & Noble is in big trouble. Well, yeah, and if you're if the the most weight they can put behind you is placement on a shelf and uh, you know probably 80% of people buy their books on Amazon, then that shelf placement is uh, doesn't mean what it used to mean. No, it doesn't. Um, and actually, there's less and less books being racked in Barnes & Noble. So... And, but everybody's uploading their books to Amazon, so how do people find you there? Well, the good thing is you do have the internet and social media. Um, that was a lifesaver for a lot of authors like me who had the rights back to our backlist. The day uh, Random House gave me the rights back to the Area 51 books, I looked at my li wife and said, well, I just got my retirement. And that has proven – I'm not retired. I'm never going to, going to, but that has proven to be true. It's a huge money maker for me. So, so talk about that a little bit. So you had a series uh, that you, in essence, kind of uh, ended 17 years ago. You, you got to the to the end of it. Uh, you moved on. What did you move on to write after Area 51? Uh, I, I, don't, I can't even remember. The I wrote a series called Atlantis, which is somewhat similar to uh, Area 51. I wrote a historical trilogy uh, about West Point. I, I loved the mini, HBO miniseries Rome. I wrote a historical miniseries called Duty on a Country, taking two fictional cadets back in 1842 with Ulysses up in the Civil War. Um, wrote a bunch more thrillers, but more um, covert thrillers, the Shadow Warrior series. Um, uh, Co-wrote three romances with Jennifer Cruzy. Um, and then I started a time patrol series, and then I was a time patrol back to my science fiction. One thing I had to do is start linking my series. We kept like, I have a series called The Cellar about a housewife and a female assassin who run a secret organization. And now they're in my time patrol books and they're in my night stalker books. So there's a lot, a lot of cross pollination. Yeah. I, I love it when an author does that and you, uh, you can carry from one series to the next. And it's like, Oh, this is, you know, this is classic Bob Mary's bringing this character over. to, And uh, I, I think a lot of, a lot of readers really geek out over that. Well, hopefully. I had 42 books traditionally published, and I got the rights back to all of them except the co-written ones. Now I think I'm somewhere in the 70s um, total titles. So at, uh, what year did you realize that publishing was changing and that self-publishing was going to be kind of the new juggernaut? Um, 
And and then how long did it take you to get your – well, for, did you have to ask for your rights back or did they uh, volunteer that? Most of them I got back over the years. Um, and it always frustrated me because I always felt like I would get a new publisher and I'd be like, oh, look at the rights I got to these books. And I felt like, boy, if you would just you know pick up these backlist titles, we could do really great. And I understand why they didn't do that because of shelf space. The only ones I really didn't have were the Area 51, and I just bugged the hell out of Random House. I hit that golden moment where the paperback sales were lower, uh, going lower just before ebooks started going up. And I managed to – the editor called up one day because I was bugging the hell out of him. He said, would it make you happy if I gave you the rights to all the books? And I said, yeah. And I got those, and I think that was 2010. So I hit the front wave, what I call the golden age of uh, – Self-publishing. That was a great time for the few of us who were there. We made tons of money. And then it got saturated, but I was in there from the very beginning. Um, I kind of like to think I invented the term hybrid author in a blog post, I think in 2011, when I was still traditionally publishing, but I was indie publishing at the same time. Um, you know, that wave crested, and now we're back into the trenches fighting it out. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, did you did you see the uh, the new indie revolution coming? Did did you have an idea that e readers were going to be as big as they turned out to be? Not really. Um, I just was keeping track of the business, and someone approached me and said, "Do you have the rights back to your books?" And I said, "Sure." And so we worked together, and we started bringing out my backlist. Um, so it's not as easy as people think. It took three years to really learn how to do it. I can do all of it now. I mean, I can, I know how to, I like to think I'm an entire publishing house from idea all the way through the book, uh, being live. I mean, I do the formatting, all the rest of that, but it's, it's, it's complicated, especially when you have over 70 books you got to keep track of. Um, that was, that took quite a while to get those books back out in print. Yeah. Th- just the, uh, the updating of, uh, of front and back matter. Yep. Uh, when you got new books coming out and making sure that, okay, am I letting people that read this other book know that a, a new book is coming out? It's, uh, you know, authors really have power now, but with that power comes, uh, you know, all the responsibility and all the work too. Yeah, definitely. And I also worked with, I got published by 47 North. They published, I think, seven books of mine, um, which was an interesting experience when they were first starting out Amazon publishing. And they're really big now. Yeah, and they're doing a lot of good stuff for a lot of authors now. Uh, and and I guess you know when you when you think about what a traditional publisher can bring you in placement, I think Forty Seven North and and some of their other imprints are, are are figuring out a way to do that in the digital world. Oh yeah, they've they've blown the doors off for a couple of people right now. So that's one of my goals. I'm looking down the line, hopefully to hook up with Thomas and Mercer, their mystery thriller imprint, um, and do something with them. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so you've got a new book in the Area 51 series coming out uh, in, in just a few weeks. Um, but tell us about – what's the story of, of the Area 51 books? Um, who, who are the main characters and, and what is the, the gist of, of this story if people are not familiar with it? Um, basically, my idea was, you know, what is that Area 51? So I had a, a, ex, a special forces guy get assigned to the security force out there, and he realizes something – uh, funky's going on. The security is just too extreme for him. And they find out there's an alien ship uh, hidden there. And then the, really the series is trying to discover, all right, why was this ship here? And ultimately the story gets to in the last book, Area 51, The Truth, Who Are We as Humans? Well, <laughs> as a spoiler, um, the ending of Area 51, The Truth, where one of the characters says this is what human beings are and these are what the aliens are, isn't quite the truth. And I think that's the key to the series. One of my maxims is we know a lot less than we think we know. So one of the things that happens in this book is um, they're digging deeper and deeper into who it's who we are as individuals and who we are as a species and where's our place in the universe um, and how do we all kind of fit together. Uh, in doing research for these books, have you, uh, have you ever come upon something uh, that surprised you? A lot of things surprise me. I, like I said, we don't know as much as we think we know. Like the Great Sphinx, everybody goes, oh, they assume they know when it was built. They don't really know. They don't know why the Great Pyramid was built. They know the Great Sphinx is weathered by water. So what does that mean, you know, time-wise? Um, so many things I found, though, like just a small thing. I was researching the uh, Sphinx one time, and just one line caught my attention. And this is how the books go. You know, that's Sir Richard Francis Burton visited. Now, he's an interesting guy. You know, translated the Kama Sutra, traveled all over the world, 
Then I found out when he was when he died, his wife burned the manuscript over his dead body. That, that's a true fact. And I thought, well, what's that manuscript? So I, that ended up being an entire book. They searched for the other copy of Burton's lost manuscript, which tells them some secrets from the past that my characters need to know. And that's kind of I just kind of followed the research and dots kept connecting. It was always shocking that something would come up that was true when you were wishing, boy, this would be really neat if this was true. Yeah. One thing I've learned, Bob, in, in uh, researching a, a series that I'm writing is that uh, as soon as you think you know something uh, historical, uh, there's usually something very weird and strange uh, going on that, that history doesn't tell you. And uh, the, the real truth is always much more exciting than what we think it is, or in a lot of cases it is. And, and uh, a lot of times truth is stranger than fiction. Well, a lot of times the truth, historians almost write fiction sometimes. You know, you, you ne- don't necessarily have to trust what they're writing. I mean, that miniseries, Rome, really blew my mind because th- what they did in that miniseries and I did in my Duty on a Country series is I put two fictional characters causing every significant action from 1842 at West Point to the start of the Civil War to the Battle of Shiloh, and they're kind of causing it all. It happened anyway. I just gave it a different reason for happening. Um. Have you ever found a, uh, a historical, uh, kind of a weird piece of history that you couldn't tie into Area 51? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. I've tied in a lot. I mean, I've tied in, you know, so many bizarre, weird things uh, because everything comes from somewhere. You know, the legend of vampire comes from Vlad Tepe's, so Vlad the Impaler. So he was a real person. So I go back there and say, all right, what if he was, was somebody different than he appeared to be? The legend of Atlantis, there's got to be a basis to everything. So I try to find what the basis is. And there's a lot of interesting theories out there. Um, on this book, I had to do a lot of research on the solar system. And I was just kind of stunned at how little we know about our own solar system. I mean, I was looking at things that, you know, we just discovered this in 2014. You know, I'm like, okay, <laughs> glad I went to school so many years ago because everything's changed. Well, yeah, and and there's a lot of things that we we kind of spout as scientific fact that uh, that they're really just theories, but we just repeat them so often they just kind of become part of the vernacular. Like no one's ever actually uh, witnessed a black hole yet. We right. we talk about them like they're like they're real, and and they may or may not be. I don't know, but yeah, we just had our first well, 2012, our first human vehicle on interstellar, Voyager one. Up till then, we were just guessing what was. And now everything we got is from one little tiny probe that went through it. And, you know, that's that spot. It's sort of like if you land on Earth in the middle of a desert, you think the whole Earth's a desert. Right. Right. True. So do you think that uh, that there really are alien craft at Area 51? No. Uh, my theory on that, uh, I've served in uh, special forces and covert operations. And the thing is, if you know about it, that's not true. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a misdirection. Uh, that's uh it's called The Bodyguard of Lies. I actually have a book by that title. But when I first went into Special Forces and I joined my first unit, the commander gave me the nonfiction book called Bodyguard of Lies about the uh, covert ops in World War II. And that comes from a quote by Churchill saying, wartime truth must be attended by a bodyguard of lies. Um, so it's a whole different ball game in the real world. Well, that's no fun, Bob. <laughs> Well, it's interesting stuff. We might not want to know what's really going on. Right. Uh, when you uh, you wrote a series on Atlantis, uh, where did you start uh, looking for uh, for story ideas for that and, and to do research for Atlantis? Um, I asked myself, all right, what if this was true? What if there was an Atlantis? You know, and I kind of went from there um, and said, you know, wh- who would who founded it? Where did it start from? And then I started getting to the world. Um, you know, saying, what if these worlds are all, which kind of, I'm really show now on TV, Counterpart, um, which is about two parallel worlds interacting with each other. Because uh, I've always, my wife and I used to always joke, and I ended up writing it, a Time Patrol series, because we always loved Paul Anderson's original Time Patrol. So I kind of went back to that, you know. And time, I always tell people, don't write about time travel. It's real hard. Of course, I wrote about time travel. <laughs> uh, but it's just interesting, because it takes history. You can play with history a lot. Um, you one thing that uh, that's uh, come up over and over in our conversation is that you you don't follow the conventional wisdom. Uh, 
what uh, is there a piece of advice that you say uh, is always true and that you should never deviate from? You got it right. Now, a lot of people think there's a, a magic a handshake or a secret button you can push or a marketing gimmick you can use. I've seen people use gimmicks. Gimmicks last about six months and everybody's doing it. It's not a gimmick anymore. If you don't have the product, you can't sell it. People say, what's the best marketing tool? Well, write a good book. What's the next best marketing tool? Write another good book. Uh, you know, I make a pretty good living because I've got 70 titles out there churning for me. Uh, that doesn't mean I can sit back and do nothing. I work pretty much every day and I keep those titles moving churning constantly on social media, but I'm always moving forward. Yeah. It really is a game of, of productivity and, uh, and, and giving people something else to read, isn't it? It is. And the other aspect of it, I think 50% of being an author is running a business. Um, you could be the greatest lawyer in the world, but if you can't run a business, you're going to be a bankrupt lawyer. And it's the same thing for authors. And the one thing I did wrong early in my career was not network enough. Like this summer, my wife and I driving up to New York City for Thriller Fest. I try to get out to Seattle once a year to sit with the people at Amazon and talk with them uh, because they got to put a face with this. Uh, you feel like you go to these things and it costs costs a lot of money to do it, but you don't feel like you accomplish anything, but you accomplish a lot by just getting some FaceTime with people in the business. Um, what do you think that that, that FaceTime does for an author? Uh, obviously, with people like Amazon, that's beneficial, but what about – uh, go into conventions and networking with other authors and, and, and maybe readers. What, what do you think that gets you as an author? Um, you have no idea. Uh, Jennifer Cruz and I literally had no clue who each other was, and we got off the same plane going to the Maui Writers Conference. And two years later, we had a New York Times bestselling book between us. Um, it, I always feel it takes three years for any networking connection to bear fruit, but a lot of it is just bizarre. You've got to be – Publishing is a slow business, but when you get an opportunity, you got to jump fast. Uh, so a lot of it is just nebulous. You kind of – my wife works with a lot of authors, a lot of New York Times bestselling authors, uh, totally discreet. Uh, she signs NDAs with them. They don't know – you know, nobody knows she does it, but she does pretty well working with these people as sort of as a story streamer is what she calls it. She helps them develop their storylines. and Actually, it sounds kind of funny. She tells them what they really wrote, what they really want to write. That's brilliant. I, I love that. Um, uh, Bob, since you were kind of, uh, you were one of those people riding that early wave of the indie revolution and uh, the Kindle revolution. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, as much as the world had changed before that to then, uh, the publishing world has changed again from then to now. Uh, what do you see as, uh, as the trend now and what if, if someone was just starting now, uh, what advice would you give them to navigate the waters that we're swimming in now? Yeah, that's kind of hard. Uh, people ask that all the time. Uh, I would tend to tell an author now, try to get traditionally published, get an agent. I think it's really too easy these days for someone to you know, slap their book, their first manuscript together, put it up on Amazon, sell two copies and quit. Um because it's just, it's just the wash in new titles. If you have only one or two titles on Amazon as a self-published author, it'd be like lightning striking. Uh, if you can get an agent who might help you a bit and you get a publisher that could help you a bit, they can do a lot more for you than you can do for yourself. Um, and always look three years ahead. Try to be ahead in terms of um, the business. Nobody knows what it's going to be. I'm, it's not going well in a way. I think there's different types of authors. We're going to end up with a, too many airport authors, brand names. I mean, we've got dead authors constantly publishing right now because they're a brand. Uh, but the good thing is because you do have the ability on your own to do it. The only person that can stop you is yourself. That, that wasn't true 10 years ago. True. True. And, uh, and, and publish, uh, publish often. That's, it's probably uh, pretty good advice too. Well, that like, like you said, if you, if you don't have product to sell people, then. Um, publish often or get lucky. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, there are people who just put one thing out there and it just hit. I don't think you can follow the trends. Uh, too many people try to do that. If it's not what you want to write, don't write it. Uh, you got to write what you want to write. Yeah. yeah, if you're not enjoying it, uh, then you're not going to be nearly as motivated to get up tomorrow and do it again and get up the next day and do it again. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, well, Bob, I'm a big fan of the Area 51 series, and uh, I, I'm going to dig into all your other stuff, too. Uh, the new book uh, is in the Area 51 comes out in April. What's the title of it? Area 51 Redemption. Okay. Is this going to be the last one in the in the series? Oh, I'm, I'm already writing. Um, <laughs> I uh, knew it. What's the next? The next? Oh, Area 51 Invasion and Area 51 Interstellar. I, I kind of go in two different directions after this book. So I've already got the two books. I'm outlining them. I love it. Um, over two million copies in that series sold. Uh, is there some movie news that I heard about? Um, Ron said who did the original Area, uh, Alien movie wrote a screenplay on it. Um, that's kind of in limbo right now. Uh, nothing's happening. Um, I don't even think about Hollywood. It's so, uh, so out there, but they're, they're doing a lot more science fiction now because the CGI supports it. So you never know when something is going to happen. For sure. Uh, Bob, if people are not familiar with your work, where can they find you online? Uh, bobmayer.com. And I've got a bunch of free books there too. If people are interested in starting series. Excellent. Excellent. I'll put links to all of it in the show notes. Uh, Bob, thanks so much for taking time to come on the show today. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. What in the name of Carl Sagan was he doing in the cemetery on Halloween? What was he thinking? He whirled, expecting the headless horseman himself to be waiting on the road ahead. Or was he lurking behind? He wanted to run. But now the bridge ahead worried him. Doesn't the horseman haunt bridges? Could he avoid crossing it somehow? It terrified him. Why? It was just a stupid bridge. The gloom beneath could have been the lair of a troll. Billy Goat's Gruff. Mama used to read that. The troll waits beneath for the fattest, sweetest goat. Jason thought he saw something on the far end of the bridge. A shape of some sort. He stepped onto the bridge and gripped the knotty railing. He felt the ground drop away beneath as he edged forward. His eyes remained on the shape. It's nothing. It's nothing. Is it nothing? No troll attacked him as he reached the other shore. The looming shape was only a stupid stairwell opposite the bridge that climbed up the hill and into the main cemetery. He turned left and ran, admitting defeat and letting the fear take him over. He ran southward down the long, dark road. His initial burst of adrenaline ran its course and he slowed, then walked again, limping a little. Headstones slipped past on the right. He still had enough light that he caught his reflection occasionally in the polished stone. He looked very young and very thin. He could feel his vulnerability as he walked along. He grew aware of his own body, the touch of his starchy dress shirt and his jacket and the soft weight of his backpack. He saw himself reflected in the headstones, just a container of warm fluids, flimsy work for a blade or a hoof or a sword. He felt shatterable and transient, and his next breath was not guaranteed, oh no. The leaves made a faint oceanic rustle all around. The insects sang their three-note songs. Jason Crane, Jason Crane, Jason Crane. Jason sang a wretched pop song as he walked, something about having no self-control and no bitches and not enough money. He sang it softly, absent-mindedly, as if reciting a psalm. He passed Reese, Finnerton, Bain, Ekdal, Forest, Black, Small. There. He saw the gate at the end of the road. But the gate would be locked, he remembered. He would have to climb the embankment and cross over the churchyard. He could see the spire of the church above and the weather vane spinning against the sky. He would rather climb this gate than face that churchyard, but the spikes on top made leaping the fence impossible. Okay, just be quick. Something caught his ear, a brittle, clipping sound. He scanned the crest above and saw a horse silhouetted among the graves. It looked to be tied to a branch of the locust tree. He had heard its hooves as it shifted from foot to foot. It rustled somehow. His breath caught. He forced himself to be calm and rational. Some Halloween thing, maybe, for some event. 
He found the stairs and ascended, sideways, ready to bolt if necessary. He watched the horse, but when he neared the top he saw the rider, standing upon the shallow depression of the horseman's grave. The figure was motionless, a dim shape that absorbed light and gave nothing back. He could make out the shape of the boots and the legs and two arms held away from the body, palms down. Just a man? But the cape of the thing was not normal. It contorted painfully, twisting in the air even though the wind wasn't blowing. It wrung itself and billowed and whipped slowly, as if the figure wore a wave torn from a black ocean. And above its shoulders, is he headless? Is he headless?